Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Uh, in this video, I'm finally going to get back to my uh, videos on the individual classes for D&D 5th Edition. Um, I looked back at some of the other ones, and I kind of lost interest while I was making them. Not because I didn't think they were useful. Uh, I got a lot of really positive comments on them, which was fantastic. But it was mostly because it felt really dry. Like, all I'm doing is really reading the player's handbook verbatim and providing a couple of examples here and there. So... Uh, I want to try something a little bit different, starting with uh, with this video, which is going to be focusing on the druid, and you know we'll kind of see see how it goes. But I wanted to make them basically, you know, at least two parts. Um, the first part being sort of a history lesson of the class for the various editions, and the uh, the second part focusing mainly on their uh, unique uh, focuses, like um, for example with the bards, the bardic colleges, and stuff like that. Uh, so we're going to see how this goes. Uh, I will talk about some of the other abilities, but very briefly, and if they're not something that needs to be elaborated on, like a fighter's second attack, for example, then I probably won't mention it at all. But uh, with this with this video, we're going to start on the druid, and we'll see how it goes from there. So I've never actually really played uh, a druid before, and I've never really even so much as made a druid before. Um, it's a class that I always found interesting, but I just never really got around to, to do anything with. Um, you know, I, as I was mostly DMing, so I never really got a chance to play characters. And when I did, I would kind of go with one of my favorite types. Because it's so rare that I get the opportunity to actually play. So with, uh, with, with this, uh, like I said, we're going to first talk about the, uh, the, the history of them, like the changes throughout the editions. And with the Druid, I want to focus mainly on this first video with their Wild Shape ability and kind of how it's changed over the years or what the Druids were kind of like in the various editions. So we'll start with uh, first edition AD&D. And they're actually pretty much the same in first edition AD&D and uh, second edition AD&D. Uh, the druids had a very strong organization where there was only so many druids of particular uh, character levels in the world. And uh, so it made advancement kind of interesting. If you wanted to be the arch druid, which is the, the, the highest level of druid that they had, which uh, was like 17th level, I think, or 16th or 17th levels where you could become the arch druid. Uh, the, you would have to either challenge the, the original arch druid or they would have to kind of step down and then, then you take their place. So it's an interesting concept. Uh, but again, like I said, I want to focus mainly on their wild shape, which is the same in, uh, in first and uh, second edition AD and D. So with their wild shape, at seventh level, they get the ability to change forms three times per day. Uh, and the forms are limited to like, uh, there's a mammal, there was a uh, reptile and there was a bird and you had to take you know one of those forms and you can only use each one once so for example you can only shape change it to a mammal once per day but you could go from a mammal to say a lizard like a, you know you could go from a bear you know attacking a group of uh, people to trying to make your getaway turning into a snake and slithering off and once you're out of sight transform into a bird and fly away um, and uh, that's that's what they got for for wild shape. Uh, when they did wild shape, they would heal ten to sixty percent of the damage that they had taken. Um, so what you would do is you would roll you'd roll a d6, and whatever you rolled on the dice, you'd multiply by ten. So for example, here I rolled a three, so they would get thirty percent of the damage they took in um, at, before they shape changed. They would heal that back. Um, which meant that you had to do a little bit more math, but uh, it's something that, you know, it was kind of a way for them to, to heal up as well as turn into something that might be useful. Uh, basically, when they wild shape, they pretty much took on the forms of those creatures in all aspects. So they're like their abilities were for that creature, they attack like that creature, things of that nature. And that's kind of the, uh, the AD and D approach to it. So in uh, third edition and uh, 3.5, they got wild shape at fifth level. And it worked similarly to the polymorph spell, uh, with a few differences. Um, so, you know, which they listed out things like they take on the physical stats, but not the, uh, the mental stats. Uh, you don't get your spell casting ability, stuff like that, you know, kind of standard things that, you know, was always the same with the, uh, <clears throat> with the different types of druid wild shape. Um, at higher levels, you could shape change into different types of things like at first it was just basic animals uh you can go into larger animals as you go and then you can finally shape change into things like elementals and, and things like that at the at the <clears throat> extreme higher levels uh the problem with 
the third edition way of doing it was there was a lot of work that went into it whenever you would wild shape and you basically needed a monster manual there and you kind of had to restat your character with each uh, different form that you might take on which was a lot of <clears throat> a lot of work and uh, a lot of times the people would playing the characters would basically wait until they actually shape change into something before they tried to uh, to work out what their stats would be. So it could kind of slow, slow things down to a crawl. Not to mention the polymorph spell kept changing throughout uh, third edition. They kept kind of tweaking it, refining it, <clears throat> creating what they called the polymorph subschool. And uh, in, in subsequent books, they would have this detailed breakdown of what the subschool did. And, and it, it basically changed things enough that it started to get a bit confusing. <clears throat> when the Player's Handbook 2 came out for 3.5, they actually introduced a really nice variant that I that I kind of preferred, and if I was going to play a druid, I was probably going to pick that version. Uh, what it was is you sacrificed your animal companion and your wild shape ability, but you got to take on uh, shape changes, and you got to like shape different forms. And they were <clears throat> basically like predator modes and like beast mode and stuff like that, where you got bonuses to particular ability scores, um, like I think the Predator version gives you plus four to strength, plus four to natural armor and stuff like that, and it gave you unique uh, natural attacks. So it was a lot easier to do on the fly <clears throat> than trying to completely restat your character. So it's kind of the version that I preferred personally uh, for the third edition approach. Fourth edition, the Druids were introduced in the Player's Handbook 2, and they took on sort of a different uh, different approach. They got their wild shape as an at-will ability that they could do an unlimited number of times per day. <clears throat> they got that at first level, unlike every other version, which had to wait until, you know, 7th um, in AD&D, 5th in 3rd uh, in edition. And <clears throat> it, the shape change didn't actually grant you any unique abilities. You weren't able to do things like uh, cast your normal spells. You weren't able to use, like, normal equipment that you had. But what it did do is it opened the door to let you use different abilities, different like at will, you know, daily utility powers that had the beast form uh, keyword to it. So the only way to use them was to, to wild shape, which you could do for free. So <clears throat> it was kind of an interesting approach. And uh, I think, you know, moreover than the, the third edition way, I kind of like this version of the Druid a lot because it was really it was really simple. You know, you don't really change your stats any, you just get access to different types of attacks which with different abilities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when D&D Essentials came out, they did something a bit more drastically different with the Druid. This version of the, uh, the Druid did not have Wild Shape at all. What they had was a focus on an animal companion, which go, grew more powerful as you did. So it would take all your, like its hit points were always equal to your bloodied hit points. So whenever you leveled, it got more hit points. Uh, and you had a lot of like uh, buffing uh, powers and stuff like that. So you were kind of a more well-rounded character that had a, an animal companion that can attack for you as well. So that was the approach that they took, uh, took with D&D uh, &D Essentials. <clears throat> so now that brings us to 5th edition and the 5th edition druid. So with uh, the 5th edition druid, now in 3rd edition they had a set number that they could do per day and it kept going as you gain levels. Uh, in 5th edition, a druid can wild shape twice a day, or twice before taking a rest. I believe it's a short or a long rest would work. Um, and when you take the wild shape, it's, it's quite a bit different than what it was in the previous editions. So with this version of it, you take on basically, it's more like the AD&D version, you take on the, uh, the abilities of whatever creature you are shape changing into. So there, so you replace your hit points with their hit points. Uh, you use their attack bonus. You use their attack damages. Like you use all their physical attributes. You retain your wisdom, intelligence, and charisma scores, as well as whatever uh, saving throw um, and skill proficiencies that you had. So if you were proficient in, uh, let's just say, uh, perception, you would still have uh, your proficiency bonus in perception, even though. Uh, your new form might not have it, uh, for example. If the form that you change into has the same uh, proficiency skills as you do, or it saves for that matter, you take whichever is the greater of the two. So if your animal form has a better, um, let's just say, charisma saving throw, even though you're proficient in, say, charisma saving throws, which I don't think the druid is, but uh, let's just say that that's what they had, um, then you would take that... Uh, 
Whichever is the better of the two. And yeah, it's wisdom and intelligence, so I, I apologize for that. So if their if their intelligence uh, saving throw was better, their bonus was better than yours, even though you're both proficient in it, you would take theirs. Um, also, in addition, so you take on their hit points, so it's not like the this is not the same as healing like you did in uh, in AD and D, but it's almost like temporary hit points. So if you shape change into a wolf, I think you have ten hit points. We'll say just off the top of my head, uh, <clears throat> until you take ten damage, you use you're in that wolf form. When you end your shape change, you go back to whatever hit point total you had before you changed. So if you turn into a wolf, attacked for a few rounds, and the combat was over, um, when you turn into the wolf, you had, uh, so let's just say you had 12 hit points when you change into the wolf. Um, change the wolf, having 10 hit points, again, just using that as an example, and then shape change, and then ended your shape change to go back to your, your humanoid form, you would have 12 hit points. Um, and even if you took damage as a wolf, so let's just say you took, uh, you had 10 hit points, you took, you know, eight points of damage. When you shape change back, you would still have the 12 that you had before. So they're, they're kind of like temporary hit points in that regard. Um, <clears throat> if you are reduced to zero hit points while in your shape change form, it reverts you back automatically. And if you take any damage in excess of whatever it took to drop you to zero, that would carry over to your humanoid form. So let's just say uh, you had three hit points left in your animal form. Uh, you took five points of damage, so you would have uh, you would take two damage to your actual normal form once you come back. So if you had twelve hit points using the previous example, uh, had five left in or three left in your animal form, took five damage. When you came back to your humanoid form, you would have ten hit points instead of twelve. Uh, I hope that that helps with that. <clears throat> your gear, uh, it's up to you what you decide to do with your gear. It can either be absorbed into your form, or it can basically drop off into the space that you occupied, and then you'd have to retrieve it later. Um, I don't know what the benefit of having all your equipment drop off would be necessarily, but uh, it's just the way that it that it works. Uh, worn equipment uh, functions as normal, so like your, um, uh, I believe, if you had magical armor, you would still get the magical bonus to your your armor class. I'm, I might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that's the way that that works. Um, now, if your form has a practical ability to use some of your like handheld equipment, the DM can allow it, but it's really up to them. So let's just say you shape changed into a monkey. You might say, well, I can still, you know, pick up and use my like a club or something like that because, you know, monkeys have the ability to hold things with posable thumbs. So, you know, that's something that they might allow you to do. Um, it, you know, if you transformed into a humanoid form roughly the same size as you, the DM could say that the armor just kind of uh, still fits you and is still visible. Uh, it's really up to them, basically, how they how they do this. Uh, so that's basically the wild shape. You can't cast spells uh, when you just, when you shape change, obviously. However, if you were concentrating on a spell, shape changing doesn't break that concentration, so you can still maintain that unless something would cause you to to break it, like taking excessive damage or things of that nature. Um, other than that, you know, the druids are pretty straightforward. Uh, they, uh, the, they use their wisdom for their skill or spell casting. And of course, like, like all the other classes, their save DCs are eight plus their proficiency bonus plus their wisdom modifier. <clears throat> so let's just say, you know, using the age old example, uh, first level with a 16 wisdom, you would have eight for your base, plus two for your proficiency, plus three for your ability. So you'd have a 13 uh, DC, uh, sp uh, spell DC. Uh, and your attack for any spells that actually do attacks is your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. So using the same example at first level, you would attack at plus five. Um, they can use uh, they can use rituals uh, with some with their spells. Um, and basically they take longer to cast a spell, but I don't think it actually drains their uh, spells per day. Uh, at 18th level, they get uh, Timeless Body, so for every uh, every 10 years that pass, your body only ages one year, so it's a way of basically prolonging your life. Uh, and at 18th level, you can cast spells in your uh, wild shape form. Um, you know, as, you, as long so you can perform all the the um, components, you know, verbal, 
uh, and somatic, but uh, in your beast form, you're not able to provide material components. Again, that could be subject to, you know, if you have a form that can use it. Like, say, you, you know, have take the form again of a monkey that can actually grip things like a human does, then the, the DM may allow it, but in general, if it requires a material component, you're not able to use it. Um, now, if you have a focus, obviously it takes the place of most material components, so you know you can still use your focus uh, if you're able to, to hold on to it, for example. Uh, and at 20th level, you are considered an archdruid, which means you can shape change an unlimited number of times instead of uh, just twice before taking a, uh, a rest, so short or long. So those are the basic abilities of the uh, the 5th edition druid. Uh, it seems like a nice class. I like it. Uh, I've never really gotten around to playing one, but you know I wouldn't mind trying one out. Um, you know I hope that was helpful for at least the, the wild shape and kind of getting a perspective as to like how it's evolved over the years, why you get the hit point things that you do in 5th edition, kind of a throwback to healing in, in 1st edition AD&D and uh, things of that nature. So that was part one of my video on the druids. Uh, part two is going to focus on the different druid circles. Um, so those are kind of the focuses that you get at, uh, I, I believe, at second or third level. So, you know, I hope this video was helpful uh, for the wild shape at least. And, uh, you know, stick around. Uh, part two should be up uh, shortly hereafter uh, talking about the actual druid circles. So thank you very much, YouTube.